Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Well, we're talking about evangelism. I can't think of a better message to share today at this moment than how we have the freedom to share our faith with those around us. I want to talk about sharing from your heart. We're in our Making Jesus Known series, and I want to help you understand how evangelism can be done in everyday situations. And last week, we learned that uh, God has a big burden for the lost. And uh, he, what's, it's called the Missio Dei. That's a Latin Christian theological term for the mission of God. And basically what's happening in the Bible, this great story in the Bible going through all the pages, this narrative is this, that God is on a gracious, valiant mission to right what was wronged and restore the fellowship that was broken in the garden. That's why Jesus came, to fix what was broken and restore. And that includes you, to bring you back to him and to be in that Eden again, which is the new heavens and the new earth. And so he's still working and he's still making that possible. God doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants people to be saved. He has not come back yet because he wants the church, the bride of Christ, to help people get prepared for his coming. And we may, I also said this last week, we may at times feel a, 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 a lack of burden or desire to reach the lost. That is common. That happens to a lot of us as believers. And sometimes it's just because we get busy, we get distracted, maybe we're a little distant from God's heart. It could be a variety of things that cause it. I've dealt with it before. And sometimes you just need to fan the flame and get that flame burn again by going out and loving on those around you and praying for them. So I covered that last week. I wanna talk about today how we share from our heart. And I do believe that we have overcomplicated the simple joy of telling others about the good news of Jesus Christ. I think we've overcomplicated it. Maybe you haven't decided to evangelize yet because you're nervous that you're going to mess up getting all the points right. Maybe you haven't memorized all the scriptures you're supposed to memorize or something. Maybe you're just afraid that, you know, they're not going to believe and receive there's a lot of things that actually will stop us before we ever even start evangelizing. And what does that mean? I'll give you a basic definition. Evangelism is sharing the gospel of Jesus to everyone around you in various ways. Like your life can shine Jesus and your words can speak of Jesus. Giving and helping those in need, planting seeds like that is another way of evangelizing bringing people to your home and feeding them and, and having fellowship with them, getting to know them, uh, bringing them to church. Uh, by the way, statistics are saying that people are more likely to come to church these days, actually, believe it or not. And it all comes down to, will you invite them or not? And they'll come to your home for, to, to ask questions about God and the Bible. And so we, I think, I truly believe that we have overcomplicated it. And, and for me personally, there were times where I felt like some of the things I learned, you know, I went to go out and use them and they kind of made me get more nervous instead of just talking about Jesus and how much I love him and how much he loves me and what he's done in my life. Now, don't just take it from me. What about John Dixon's book, The Secret of Christian Mission or The Best Kept Secret of Christian Mission? He's literally an evangelist of the church. So God has gifted him with the ability to evangelize. He's, that's one of the five full gifts of ministry. And so he has been gifted as an evangelist. He's a doctor in this field. He, he has his doctor's degree. And he wrote this book, The Best Kept Secret of Christian Mission. I don't often always you know, take the time to recommend books. But if you want to learn how to evangelize in everyday life, this is an excellent book. And I put it on our website at calvarydover.org forward slash grow. This is my third time reviewing it. That's how much I love it. And this is the first story he shares. He calls it the confession of an evangelist. All right. So just in case you feel bad that you haven't been doing that well, 
um, listen to this story, and I think we can identify with him quite a bit. For the first couple of years of my life, I was pa- a passionate promoter of the Christian message. I was 15 years old and spoke about Christ to everyone who would listen. Without any background in Christianity, I just assumed everyone would want to hear what I had heard. I shared my new beliefs with my mother, my friends, my football team, strangers on the street, and even the crowds of other teenagers I met on the holiday camps my mom used to send me on regularly. In those early years as a believer, I had no idea Christians could be so shy about their faith. No one had told me I was meant to feel awkward about spreading the good news. Anyone ever feel awkward sometimes? That was something I learned only after mixing with Christians for a while. But I learned it soon enough. Because of my obvious enthusiasm for evangelism or for sharing faith with others, my church decided I should be trained in quote unquote evangelism. I had never heard of it. I just wanted others to discover what I had discovered. I did not know there was a word for it or that there was courses and books that had been written on the subject. So off I went to special classes once a week for several months where where I was trained in one of the uh, popular evangelism training tools. There I learned carefully prepared gospel outline, a set of illustrations to explain the message, and a list of Bible verses to back it all up. At the end of the course, I was turned loose on the public of Sydney, Australia. I took part in prearranged home visits, systematic door knocking, and even cold turkey walk-ups at the local shopping center. Suddenly... You ready for this? Suddenly, my joy and ability at passing on the faith evaporated. I had previously delighted in sharing Christ with others, but now it seemed a burden, a burden on my emotions as I felt the weight of the moment I had been trained for, on my memory as I tried to recall all the points of the gospel, and perhaps most of all, on my poor, unsuspecting, evangelistic targets, quote unquote, He turned people into targets instead. This enthusiastic, natural promoter of Christ had been transformed into a nervous, unnerving, quote-unquote, Bible thumper. Now, he says this, I do not blame the course itself. Many Christians around the world have been helped by this and other programs, which is true. Many people have used certain kind of evangelistic programs to help them go out, and it's helped them. I still see a place for evangelistic Uh, for evangelistic and apologetic training, and so do I. But I suspect the way the course was run in my church, combined with my over-eager personality, left me with several unhealthy perspectives on what it means to promote Christ to others. I have since discovered just how common these perspectives are in modern church circles. Maybe some of you can identify with what he's saying. When you first got saved... You were just like telling everyone of everything. I just heard a testimony in the lobby after the last service. And then when you start learning techniques and strategies, now you're trying to remember all that. Okay, let me keep going. I'm almost done, but I just thought this is too good of a story not to read all of it. I had become self-conscious about reaching out to others with the news of Christ. Suddenly, mentioning God and inviting people to church had become a specialized compartment of my faith. It had its own name, evangelism, its own propositions, and even its own multi-week courses. Whereas I once talked of God as freely as I talked about my favorite TV show or sport, now I found myself switching into quote-unquote evangelism mode, where the heart beats faster, the palms get sweaty, and you feel the pressure to steer the conversation in the most unconversational manner. And then he says this, so important, once or what was once a natural outflow of faith, something requiring little concentration, now felt like a cross between a theological exam, an acting class, and a knife edge rescue operation. He goes in to say this, it's a bit like the Australian American Idol television competition. One of the most frequent criticisms of the judges, especially in the early stages, is that the contestants' performances are self-conscious. I can, I can see the cogs turning your mind, say the judges, as you concentrate on the notes, scrambled for the lyrics, and counted out the dance moves, instead of just enjoying the song and engaging the audience. 
The parallel with evangelism is obvious. Sometimes we concentrate so hard on steering the conversation and remembering all the correct content that we've memorized that we forget the joy of the good news and the privilege privilege of sharing it with another human being who, by the way, has given you their attention. At that point, we've become, at times, self-conscious. Thankfully, he ends with this. Thankfully, after a while, he realized I need to get back to who I am. And he began to share his faith like he used to once more. See, I think we can overcomplicate it. And I know I have. I know I've tried different strategies. The reality is Jesus is in me. Jesus has saved me. I read his word. I know the scriptures. If someone, if I encounter someone, I have more than I know, more than I expect. I have all that I need too, with the Spirit's help to share my faith from my heart. Now let's look at scripture. First Peter chapter three. We're gonna be there. And then Colossians chapter four. I wanna encourage us today to share from a heart by living from our heart that loves God and letting our hearts come out in our everyday life. First Peter three, we're going to be in the NIV version online on the screen, starting with verse 13 through 15. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Peter says to the church, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not Be frightened. Just so you know, in this context of this scripture, the church was under severe persecution. And Peter's saying, your response to that persecution is being watched by everyone around you. So respond with the grace of God and and don't retaliate instead of retaliate or don't retaliate instead of respond with grace. Do not let fear of their threats or do not be frightened by them. What is he saying here is that people are watching you, okay, and don't live in fear, but instead live with confidence in Christ and joy. Why? Uh, Let's keep going in verse 15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. A lot of times we get right to the next portion of this verse and miss this really important piece. But revere Christ in your hearts Okay, what does that mean as Lord? It means to set him apart as the most important person in your life. Worship him above all, okay? Honor him in your heart and in your everyday life. There's a reason for that. Because if you do, something's gonna happen next in this verse. Always be prepared to give an answer So let's continue with verse 15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. My belief and my conviction, what I've seen is, if Jesus is important to you in your heart, you're gonna be ready to give an answer when people start asking you, why do you have so much hope? Now the word answer here in the Greek is from apologia, which is where we get the word defense or apologetics. Now, some people argue whether this is about giving a defense, like a legal argument or like um, uh, an apologetic argument back to someone who's questioning a faith. Actually, in this context, it's not because the next words are ask, whoever asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So people are inquiring in this scripture why you have so much hope and faith in your life. And he even says this, do this with gentleness and respect. So this isn't a a biblical argument, but we can take that and go, hey, we need to have apologetics ministry that's ready to know answers that people are gonna use to question the faith. What we're talking about here is everyday conversation with people and they go, why are you so happy? One of the reasons why you're so happy is because you make Jesus Lord in your heart. 
That's why we can't leave that part out. Let me, uh, let me go forward, though. I, I don't want to break that down yet. Let's go to Colossians chapter 4. It'll be on the screen as well in the NLT version. Now, the NIV version, I like how it says, uh, Paul prays for open doors. The NLT version says this, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities or open doors to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Let me stop there. Paul is in chains, okay? And he's wanting to proclaim this, this mysterious message that people are still learning of Christ. And he's asking for prayer from the church. Pray that I have open doors. One of the things that always convicts me every time I read this is he's not complaining about the chains. Peter said in, in 1 Peter 3 to suffer well, in other words. So now you have Peter and Paul both saying, look, a lot of things are going to go on in your world, but be careful how you respond and act. Be careful. And He's saying pray. Prayer and evangelism go hand in hand, just so you know. We must pray every day for the lost. We must pray that we will see the doors of, uh, of opportunity as well. And verse 5 and 6 says this, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. How often should you live wisely? All the time. All the time and especially in front of unbelievers. Uh, should you revere Christ in your hearts all the time? Yes, not a trick question, yes. And so therefore, how you live out in public will matter. So let me give you two things that we can do to start sharing our faith from our heart, our faith in Christ from our heart. And the first one is live a life that glorifies God. And secondly, be ready with a response. Live a life that glorifies God and be ready with a response. I've already explained to you that we need to have Christ as the most important person in our hearts, set apart, worshiping him, making him the Lord and leader of our lives, all right, in private, not just in front of everyone. And here's what Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12. It'll be on the screen for you. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles or aliens in this world to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your souls. Okay, so your private life, worshiping God matters. So does mine. Live such good lives among the pagans or unbelievers that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Your life should glorify God in such a way, make him, and by the way, glorifying God means to make him attractive, to give him credit, to give him praise, to let his light shine through your life by the goodness that you live out. If we do that, we're already priming people to know Jesus. But let me keep giving you another supporting scripture. Luke 6, 45. The good man brings good things out of the good treasures of his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil treasure of his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. People can see what's inside your heart because they can either see how you live or they can hear what you say. When we worship Christ and revere him as Lord in our hearts and choose to honor him in every area of our lives, the joy of the Lord, the peace of Christ, the love of God flows out of you naturally. When you bump into someone, uh, they encounter the grace of Christ. 
rather than the flesh of anger that we can carry sometimes. Amen? A life that worships God privately, this is an important takeaway. What we're, what we're hearing here is a life that worships God privately will be a life that shines God publicly. It's simple as that, isn't it? If we are worshiping God privately, he will come out of your life publicly. But Matthew 5, Jesus says, make sure you don't put a lid or a cover over your light. So don't try to hide the light. Instead, it's on a hill for all to see. Sometimes we get ashamed to hide what we have in Christ, and we need to be careful of that. Uh, just so you know, too, one more important takeaway here. Your life already speaks a message to people around you. Did you know that? Your life already speaks a message to people around you. The goal is to speak and paint a picture of the love and truth of God. That's the goal. Uh, just so you know, your life already tells people what you care about. Um, people can tell whether you care about your lawn, can't they? People can tell if, they, if you care about your car. Is he out there washing his car a third day in a row? <laughs> the blinds, you know, they put the blinds down. What? People can tell, you know, that you love coffee. You keep pulling up in their window to get that coffee. It's a necessity to you, right? Yeah. It's like oxygen, right? They know that that matters, right? They know, they, people know if you love sports. You know, one way we can simply evangelize is let people see how much we love God. Let people hear the message of Christ and his love and his hope just ooze out of you and pour out of you into their lives. You're already speaking a message to people around you. The question is, what is it? What is it? Are you mindful of what you're showing? Now in Colossians 4, 2 through 5, a life that glorifies God is someone who's devoted to prayer. Again, I'm talking about glorifying God in private, okay? Revere Christ as Lord and also in public. And so we begin in our private life in Colossians 4, Paul says we begin by praying. We're devoted to prayer. And then we begin to pray for those who are out there as evangelists and pastors and ministers, but also one another, because we've all been called to share Christ, may not be with the giftings that certain people have, but we should pray for other believers that there would be open doors to share Jesus Christ. So that prayer life now goes into live wisely among those who are not believers, making the most of every opportunity. I said this last week, let me say it again. When we pray for the lost, you will see the doors of opportunity more often. Why? Because your heart has already been tuned to see things differently. Because you spent 15, 20, or whatever minutes, even a moment before you got out of your car, you know, sometimes you got to do that. Sometimes you drove to work stressed out about what you got to do when you get home. Sometimes you need to turn off the car or if it's really hot, leave it on with the AC and you need to have a little talk with God and go, God, whew, all right, I, I, you are on mission at my office. Help me have the eyes to see what you want me to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Simple as that. If you didn't get a chance to pray for anyone at your workplace, take a moment and say, God, I know you're up to something. I know you're working. You always are. We sing that song. Even when we don't see it, he's working. Not just in your personal life, but he wants people saved. Okay, that's a little, that's a little tough rebuke right there. We make it all about ourselves. He's also working really hard in the mission field. Even when we don't see it, he's working. Let's sing that song and also live that out and start sharing and being in the mission, the missio day of helping people see Jesus. So pray so that you can see like Christ sees. All right? To play on the analogy, though, of Paul saying, Lord, give me open doors. Pray for open doors to happen. 
Here's what I, God, God just dropped that in me, this in me, and I wanted to read it out to you. Live a life that attracts people to God while you're walking through the hallways of life waiting for an open door. Live a life that attracts people to God and you're already praying and now you're living the way you should and you're praying for that door to open and the thing is, is they've already been watching you around the workplace. They've already been watching you in the hallways of life. They have seen you in your neighborhood. They have seen how you handle your kids. Not saying you don't have bad days. Been there, done that. They see that. They've heard you talk to other employees. They've seen how you've treated them with integrity. They see how you operate your business with integrity. They, you go above and beyond when you show up at their house to fix a toilet. Whatever it may be, they are watching you and you've been praying. And now the door is open. Do you see it? And do you take it? Now, what could that door be? Is it a systematic evangelistic plan on sharing Jesus Christ? There is not one place like that in the Bible. I asked my dad, who's a pastor, I asked other pastors, is there an official plan that Jesus said, do these three things and then tell them how to be saved and then it will work every time? It doesn't exist in the Bible because Jesus led people to him through so many different avenues. The apostles led people. Peter himself, he went to go pray and he sees a man at the beautiful gate and, and the man's begging for help. And he says, I don't have any money, but what I do have, I will give to you. And he prays that the man would be healed and the man was healed. Now that turned into, now he has to have a response for what in the world just happened? He tells them the message of Jesus Christ. He doesn't go, oh man, okay. All right, so Romans road is, all right. Romans three first, and then let me get, no. He tells them what he experienced. He tells them what he witnessed. He tells them who Jesus is. Now I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But sometimes some of us can't operate that way. And now, and now we all struggle to share our faith from our heart. What did, what did Peter do? He shared, by the way, this is the one who hid and denied Jesus. He denied Jesus three times. And then they all hid until he rose again. Okay. He shares a message with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helped him respond. He gets in trouble for it. They take him to the Sanhedrin for a hearing and they say, you need to stop talking about, and one, you know what he got in trouble for? He got in trouble for saying that Jesus rose again and that we will have resurrection life in Acts chapter three. He got in trouble for that. How many of you know that we will rise again in the end and be resurrected to be with Jesus? How many of you know that? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. If you were Peter in that moment and you said that, that caused him to go to the Sanhedrin in front of a bunch of Jewish leaders and have to give a reason for why he's saying all this. That was not a systematic evangelism training plan. Do this, do this, do this. He shared what happened to Jesus. Okay? God used that as an open door in front of the Sanhedrin to witness and tell them the gospel. And they were so amazed at his response that they said, this man had to be with Jesus. Now, because Jesus is revered in his heart, now Peter is living like Jesus, which is why we get the word Christian to be Christ-like. See what happened there? Peter was just going to a prayer meeting, living life, and God opened doors as he obeyed and shared from his heart what God can do. That was it. Now, praise the Lord for that. That's more simple than I thought. Yeah. So here's the second part. Okay, we said, let God be glorified in your life. Okay, shine him. Secondly, be ready with a response. Be ready with a response. If Christ is, is one in your life, he's number one, he's at the center, 
you have plenty of things to share of how he's done, what he's done for you. And the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance what you need to say and do as well. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Colossians 4, 6. This is what Paul says. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so you will have the right response for everyone. Always be prepared, Peter, again, to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. This past week, I was praying and walking my neighborhood, praying, praying for our world, praying for this message, praying for our church. And the word that God dropped in my heart, I couldn't get this word out of my head. It kind of took over my thoughts was the word bankrupt. When I was praying for the world. And my heart started grieving for our world. Our world is spiritually bankrupt. Emotionally bankrupt. Mentally bankrupt. Physically bankrupt. Financially bankrupt. Whatever it may be. But the main thing I got was that our people and our, our neighbors, our society, they don't have hope. They're in despair. People are so lost in sin, they're deceived. They're, they're bankrupt, bankrupt with knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. They're in so much pain and so much dis- depression. And yet we have Jesus. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We're strong in the midst of this world. And they're going to ask you why. And you're going to run into someone who's so bankrupt. And by the way, don't look at this in a physical way either. It's not just the poor and destitute. It's the rich and well off. If they don't have Jesus, you're bankrupt. You don't have life everlasting. That's why Jesus confronted the rich young man in the Bible. He did everything right. He had all the riches except for one thing. Jesus was not his Lord and Savior. He did not worship God. That, my friends, is our society. They are bankrupt. But here's the thing about that. You ready for this? You have more than enough of Jesus Christ overflowing out of you. They will... They will take everything you have to share and to say in that moment. God is going to use those moments when you bump into someone who is in despair. I don't know how many times I have seen people in grocery stores, uh, in, in shopping places, out in life. I was in the Dover Mall um, last weekend. Church, I'm telling you, I felt a despair in that entire building. You look around, people look miserable. I started praying. I started praying. I started asking God, you know, give me a chance to encourage. Yesterday, we were out shopping, my wife and I. By the way, when you get older and you have a date moment, you go shopping, just so you know. Um, (laughs) It's the way it is. It was actually kind of fun. I had a good time. I had a good time hanging out with my wife. By the way, there's a dangerous aisle in Aldi's. <laughs> Everyone knows what aisle that is too, right? It's all the different things you can have for your lawn. And that, that, that thing is dangerous. Man, you got to hold your wallet. Keep it there. Keep it still. Man, I took every moment I could to encourage people. Uh, it's, I've run into people and I said, are you okay? Because they're huffing and puffing. They're struggling. They seem like they have a bad day. And I I don't know, I've lost count. I've lost, I can't remember the names. I can't remember sometimes the faces. I've done this so much where so I see that. I see it and I go, can I pray for you? Are you okay? And they'll say, no, I'm struggling. You know, I'm just stressed out. And I'll just just be like, do you mind mind if I just take a moment to pray for whatever it is? Do you know how many people will say yes? Yeah, you'll get a few that will say, no, nah, I'm good, I got hurt. I don't, I don't do it when people are in a hurry that much, you know? And by the way, um, I've been praying that God will keep every piece of hair on my head. Yeah. 
uh, so that I can keep getting a haircut at the place I go because I want that entire place to be saved and to worship God. And uh, it's, it's funny, I know, but I'm being dead serious. I'm praying that God does not allow me to lose any more hair. And I said in the nine o'clock, I'll just put on a wig if I have to. Hey, I need a trim. You know why though, right? I'm in that chair for 20, it used to be 30, but now I've lost so much hair, it's more like 20. I'm in that hair for 20 minutes, or in that hair, <laughs> in, in that chair. Oh my goodness. I'm in that chair for 20 minutes. And it, it hey, how's your day? That, they always ask me, how's your day? What, what, you, what are you up to for work today? <laughs> I mean, for me, it's an easy segue, right? But I don't have to always play the pastor card, okay? I can also just tell them, man, I, I'm just thanking God for what he's given me. My kids, you know, they're serving God. What, who's this? What do you mean? I mean, every single time, we just got to seize those opportunities. When Jesus is revered in your heart, he is going to overflow. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. In church, people are so desperate for hope, Jesus is hope. People are so desperate for love, Jesus is love. People are in so much conflict, Jesus is peace. We have the answer. It says, give, give the answer for the reason of the hope you have. Jesus is the answer. Amen. Yes. Now, yes, amen. <laughs> now I'm doing training here, so let me say this. Don't just leave with that. Well, Jesus is the answer. What do you mean? How has he impacted your life? What has he done? Do you remember my solo stove story? I'll close with this and two last takeaways. Do you remember my solo stove story? The, the, the fire pit that I, that I was gifted? I had prayed for that. Just so you know, I, I was, our, our fire pit rusted out at the bottom. I was recommended a fire pit. It's over $200. I was like, Lord, I don't have that right now. You know, but if you want to gift it to us, if you want me to have it, you will send it or you'll send the money to give it or to go purchase it. Seven days later, a friend of mine says, I did a product review. They sent me the solar stove. I don't want it. Do you want it? I said, yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> but, and I didn't think, you know, I, I prayed that, but I was just kind of like, you know, I didn't think that that was like on the top of God's priority list. You know what I mean? There's, there's bigger things to, to fix. And uh, do you know I keep sharing that story with people everywhere I go that we get to talking about, you know, life, you know, fire pits, camping, summertime, whatever. And God keeps using that story. Maybe that's why he did it. How many times has God helped you? How many times has God showed up in your life? How good is he? We sang goodness of God. I'm telling you, people are so bankrupt, bankrupt Emotionally, spiritually, there's, there's a lack that any just shred of a sentence where you share or they see it in your life, they come asking you, what's the reason for the hope that you have? We overcomplicate it, don't we? So let me end with this. Let's not overcomplicate sharing Jesus. He means so much to us and has done so much for us. Choose to let the goodness of Jesus flow from the center of all you do and say. And lastly, and these notes are online, calvarydover.org forward slash grow. Lastly, you're more than ready to share your story and the reason for the hope, joy, peace, and love you have from knowing Jesus. I don't know, Ryan. I don't know if I'm ready. Try it. First of all, should we be worshiping God in our private life and in our public life? Something's going to happen then. You're not even going to have to try. The doors and the opportunities are going to come knocking. But I, I encourage you to try too. And watch the Holy Spirit use your testimony and your life. Amen? Why don't we stand together? Praise God. Thank you, Lord. God, 
we love you because you first loved us. And now we're going to be conduits and instruments and channels of your love to our community. Lord, we sanctify ourselves to honor you in our private life and in our public life. May you be glorified in how we conduct ourselves, how we think and how we speak and how we love those around us. God, I pray, Lord, because your light is going to shine and I pray, God, that we would be that light because it's so dark out there, it's not gonna be that hard to see your light. And God, may this church help lead the way along with all the gospel-centered, Jesus-centered churches, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching churches in our state. God, let us lead the way. And it may start as well with us, as you gave us the word earlier, to love one another in this place. God, we live our lives centered around you and your word, nothing else. We all fix our eyes on Jesus and your word. And so we can live in unity and harmony with one another. And God, we want to live in unity and harmony with you. And so out of the overflow of that, we'll be you into those around us. Use us in a powerful way. Give us eyes to see the open doors. Let us pray for them, God. Remind us to pray. And God, let us share the hope that we have, whether it's through tangible help, whether it's through our words. Lord, whatever it may be, use us powerfully this week. We exercise our freedom, Lord, in Christ to love others. Thank you, God. We give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.